Welcome to the Deep Specialization Podcast, the show where we blend focus, strategy, and client intimacy in order to scale and simplify our businesses and our lives. I'm your host, Corey Quinn. Let's jump into the show. Today, I'm joined by the owner of Digital Mastermind, John Soracas. Welcome, John. Corey, thank you so much for having me, man. I'm super excited for our conversation. You run a mastermind group called the Digital Mastermind. You're also an agency owner, so you're deeply immersed in the agency world. So I I can't wait for our conversation today. Let's kick off things by, um, would you mind sharing a little bit about uh, Digital Mastermind, what what it is, who is it for, and uh, what it's all about? Yeah, it's a mastermind group that's been around for over 10 years. And uh, there is close to 100 members, and it's peer to peer. So it's agencies sharing from their mistakes and their wins and providing perspective to one another. And we have uh, biweekly calls, we keep in touch via Slack as well. And then we have a really gnarly yearly meetup where we bring in experts uh, like yourself. Um, And then there's also all the agencies that are giving presentations based on what's working in their agencies and what's not. It's it's phenomenal. And we all share breakfast, lunch, and dinner over two and a half days. It's really cool. Oh, that's awesome. What was happening 11 years ago in your world that caused you to realize that, hey, I'd like to launch this, this experience for agency owners? So a friend of mine actually started it. And he uh, he just he, he sent out some books to some some agencies that he wanted to all get together. So we got together and it was just a uh, it was a yearly meetup. It was a yearly meetup for for years. And um, he handed it over to another gentleman that uh, ran it for a short time. He's like, I, I can't I can't stand this. And so he handed it over to me. And then um, we changed it where we brought it more, more interactive. So we created a, a Slack channel and we also uh, started doing bi-weekly calls and then also other calls that are very tactical when it comes to things like SEO or paid search or EOS. There are a lot of members in there that, that are EOS project management where these um, uh, others bring in their team. So we have essentially 70 agency owners, but they also have their teams in there. So there's a lot of peer-to-peer training that's that's going. So our philosophy is all boats rise and bring in the best of the best for for webinars and other trainings that can really help out, man. It's it's, it's immense. I met my business partner in there. Um, there's a lot of agencies that have merged and sold and just, just a lot of positive activity that just keeps spreading. When did you, at what point did you get involved in this to kind of run it? It was 2018. Okay, so you're on your uh, sixth year this year. Yeah, to the quick happy math. Happy birthday! Yeah, happy birthday! That's awesome. And so before that, you were an agency owner. I believe you're still an agency owner. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Yeah. And so you were you in the group when when um, at that point in 2018 when you decided to take over, or were you were you on the outside? Okay, so you've been a part of it for a while. Yeah, been a part of it. Yeah, since uh, since the beginning, and okay. uh, yeah, so been a part of the the full evolution. Yeah, I've owned an agency since two thousand nine. So, um, it, what was really cool is getting into a group where with other peers that th- it's not dogmatically led by one person. Where it's hey, this has to be the way. I'm one of those people. It can be a very contrarian thinker, right? Where you you hear a concept, you're like, I don't know, that doesn't that doesn't fit me, or you hear somebody that has all of these ideas, we don't have to take them all on. You can treat it like a buffet. I think that's something that's very powerful in the group. So you get all these like little snippets and things where you get to craft your own fingerprint, which is your business. Sure. That's awesome. There's a saying, you know, the, the, the sage from the stage, there's no sage up there trying to, you know, get everyone to, to uh, drink Kool-Aid. I, I think that's, that's really cool. What type of agency, uh, what size typically does this mastermind attract? There's a few that are uh, hovering around a million. I'd say most of them are between two to five million. Mm -hmm. And then the largest, I'd say, is around 70 million. And what is happening in a agency founder's world that causes them to say, hey, you know, I got to. I got to, I got to find a group that can help me kind of get to the next level. Like what, what is typically the challenge that they're trying to solve? I think they, they want more perspective, right? And the way mm-hmm. I look at this, cause I've seen pods and some of these other, other groups were like, all right, we're just going to lump all the, the larger agencies into one. We're going to take all mm-hmm. the smaller agencies into another. And I think there's a, there's a lot of credence to that. But on the flip side of that, 
they're missing a really valid point. I think that valid point is the smaller agencies are going to take on immensely more risk. They're going to try things because in some cases they're addicted to shiny things. Well, those <laughs> shiny things are typically tools and tactics and all these new things that they're going to bring to the group. Whereas the, the other agency is it's a larger ship. They can't steer it, it nearly as quickly. So when you blend that together, it's, it's fantastic. So you'll have some of these larger agencies sitting there while somebody is pitching what's working in their agency and it's, yeah. and it's really small and just seeing them light up and like, whoa, that is really cool because they're continually trying all these new things and they're, they have the ability to fail faster and why they can tr take on risky things. Yeah, that innovation, they can take on those riskier things, but at the end of the day, their loss is immensely less because you know they, they have fewer, uh, fewer dollars to lose. That's right, that's right. They're further off, they're closer to the ground. It actually kind of reminds me of, I've, I've heard the similar situation where you have these large brands, like consumer brands that have an internal agency, but they actually hire third-party agencies because the third-party agencies are much more nimble and much more cutting edge, right? TikTok and all these emerging brands and platforms and so on and so forth that they, they have no way of being able to um, know what the, what the, the latest, latest trend is. So they, they hire these other sort of external uh, specialists. Yeah, then they're just too far from it. And at the end of the day, the the expense of trying to even implement those uh, in your own agency, it's it's not smart if you're process driven and you're and you're yeah. really focused on a specific vertical or specialty. So now with seventy agency owners in the group, probably more over time, um, you've probably seen a lot of sort of the the different challenges that that agencies face. What are some What are some of the big kind of if you were to kind of think about them from a 10,000 foot view, what are some of the big major challenges that agencies face as they're growing through these different milestones? One is just recruitment, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's it's not just a basic thing of, hey, I need to, to hire people. It's really getting solid talent and people that are going to fit with your culture and the way that you do whatever it is that you do. Mm -hmm. And you'll see... And I'm sure you've uh, heard this from others where people go, it's almost like getting um, uh, investment for, for an idea. You start with like your friends and family round, right? All right, people <laughs> hire their friends and their family. And, yeah. then, uh, and then they go to this, this other ring where, um, you know, all right, there, there, there's a little bit better talent and as you keep scaling up. And the other thing too is some agencies will hit a ceiling and they feel like they can't grow based on delivering their best work. And that's where we highly recommend finding partners to do that work and figuring out a model so you can work with other A players and those A players don't necessarily have to be with you in your agency. So I'd say recruitment is one of them. I'd say the other is actually something that's along the, the lines of what you do. It's, it's selecting uh, a niche, whether that's a, a vertical or a specialty. Most, some of the most su successful agencies, the most profitable have, have done that and had a niche focus. And then I would say the other is just really getting an understanding of their, their profitability. I think too many people will try, I hate putting it this way, but I don't know of another way to put it in the client um, relationship where they're almost like the abused spouse in that relationship. And they're actually not making the profitability that they deserve and just understanding the, the worth and the value of their agency so they can actually get the dollars that they deserve. That's great, I'd love to break these down a little bit further. Um, when it comes to recruiting, finding solid talent, what are some best practices that you've seen some agencies take before maybe they go and, and partner out? Maybe like, how do, they, how do they bring and source in like amazing talent? I think one is getting a clear understanding of what it is that they want and how it's mm -hmm. going to fit in. So scorecards, personality tests, uh, skills tests, I think those are some some really great uh, tools that that can be used. Building a building a recruiting program uh, internally, so they can either hire staff internally where they they can recruit, or doing campaigns where they're looking for talent. I think mm -hmm. too many people will just put up a job ad and they're they're just going to to wait. I think you really have to be out either a networking, having somebody doing that, or b literally calling on people that you want to to work for your agency. I'm sure a lot of founders listening to us right now is saying, great, John, I have one, one more thing for I have to go out and do. So yeah. what is the, who's the right person to do this in the agency? I love seeing it when it's at a founder level because it has gravitas. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. um, it's something that I do as well as my business partner where, we're, okay, we want to find this role. What, a few things that we'll do um, are we're going to reach out to our network. Hey, do you know somebody that's solid that's going to, to, to fit into this? And that's another great component of having a, a peer group. 
And then the other is I'm going to look for somebody that's doing really great work. And I'm just going to start having conversations with them. And I'm always doing, it. I'm continually doing that. Mm -hmm. But if those people can't do it, then yeah, of course, you're going to pass it to somebody else. Some other agencies have hired internal recruiters, um, which is something that I've seen, but I haven't necessarily experienced firsthand and within, within my own agency. And they've had great success doing that. Yeah. Yeah. My last company, we, we were at one point over a thousand employees and we, I think we had a hiring team of three that were just, that, that was their full-time gig. And that was obviously a much bigger scale, but yeah, I've seen that work out really well. When it comes to selecting a niche, like what are, what are some things you're seeing agencies do well in that process and maybe some, some areas where they get caught up? What I'm seeing done well is where people have done specific work for a, within a vertical or it might even be their specialty. Sure. And uh, they, re they, they, they step into it. So they begin marketing to that space and then mm. it gets a little bit of traction and then they begin moving in that. And then they do an overall brand communication that says, hey, we do doggy daycare centers or yeah. we do uh, fill it in. On the flip side of that, I've seen this tragically fail where somebody had made that overhaul, turned away business because we're the new, I'm, I'm kind of calling out somebody here, but I'm not going to mention their name. We're the e-commerce e business for outdoor sporting companies, right? Okay. And just not knowing enough about that space and realizing what, you know, what's actually the, the market segment in there and then watching their agency, you know, deteriorate before they had to pivot and go back yeah. to what it is that they were doing before. So that I'm assuming based on how you uh, shared that they made the decision too quickly without fully understanding what they were signing up for. Totally. Yeah. And there you, and there's fun spaces and you have to be very careful with fun spaces, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a reason that people don't get paid well at, at zoos and theme parks. It's because it's a fun <laughs> place to work, right? Or so ESPN, when you end people who work for, or, you know, <laughs> right, yeah, these places, they make no, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, true. Yeah. yeah, because there are so many other people vying for that, that the right. supply and the demand, it's just, yeah, the, the numbers don't make sense. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's what ended up happening to that agency. That's interesting. And then when it comes to profitability, what are some of the stumbling blocks that agencies come across? Uh, first off, they don't even know what it is. <laughs> so um, how, so they, how, they, I'll interrupt you here. So how do you define profitability? Like what is, what is, what are they, what should they be looking for? Uh, margin. And I mean, mm -hmm. your real margin. Okay. What yeah. is your net net? What, what are mm -hmm. you actually making as a business when right. everything is all paid, said and done? Right. So what is your true net net? And it starts on, on the high level, right? So if you have, whether it's a labor hour or you're doing value-based pricing, you have to understand what the margin for that agency is going to be. So once you know that on a high level, and then you can dig in on whether it's a specific service or on the overall account. So when you understand that profitability, uh, you can run a substantially more healthy agency. Beautiful. Agency owners, in 2024, do you want to finally escape founder-led sales? My book, Anyone Not Everyone, gives you a unique solution to a big problem that digital agency owners face, serving too many types of clients. In my book, I guide you through my proven five-step process, helping you to transform from a generalist to a vertical market specialist. The best part is the methods in this book are simple, authentic, and effective. It's been endorsed by well-known author, Dr. Benjamin Hardy, legendary marketer, Aaron Ross, positioning expert, April Dunford, gifting expert, John Rulin, as well as many leading agency owners and thought leaders. So whether you're a seasoned agency owner or just getting started out, my book, Anyone Not Everyone, is your ultimate resource to unlock your agency's potential and scale revenue. The book launches in March, and the good news is that you can go to my website right now and sign up to be notified when it launches. You'll also get access to some early bonuses just by signing up to be notified today. Go to anyonenoteveryone.com. That's anyonenoteveryone.com. Now back to the show. What would you say about the challenges about running a an agency where gosh you know maybe there's a maybe there's a person who is valuable in some respects but maybe toxic at the same time from a culture perspective mm -hmm. how does uh, how do, how do you handle these things because i think it happens it, a lot it, it does you unfortunately it, it, you know I, i've seen some people make the mistake of treating a, like a 
like a band-aid where you just like rip it off and you just completely mm -hmm. get rid of that person. But what happens is you can have account loss. You can have culture issues because, you know, whether they're toxic, it doesn't mean that necessarily everybody at the agency you felt that. So I think that you have to be very surgical in the way that you remove that type of person from your agency. So first off, that person does have to go if you can't correct it. And what I look at is like toxic. It's it's toxic, right? It is mm. uncorrectable, right? Um, you, you you poured bleach into the bacon. All right, we're not eating the bacon. But in, in removing that person, yeah, you you have to be very thorough and conscientious, conscientious in the way that it's done. And I think the best way mm. to do it too is not burning that bridge with that person. In some cases, I've seen other agencies take a while to do this. They remove their power slow, slower and slower, and mm. then they eventually will extract that person out of the agency. Yeah. Such a delicate, uh, delicate topic, especially if they're on the sales side. I've, I've, I've experienced this where you have a, a highly producing salesperson, which is great, but then there's all this collateral damage and, and being able to balance the, the impact, to the revenue and, and culture and all those things, it definitely becomes much, like you said, very surgical. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's really jarring. So mm. if this person shows up on you know client calls for their accounts, or even if it's a, it's an account manager, and mm. people have worked with that person for a long time, but internally they're a Tasmanian devil just creating tornadoes. You don't want to badmouth that person to the client, so you del delicately have to uh, approach it. And yeah. it, it's never easy for anybody, but yeah, I mean, there's an agency listening to this and they're dealing with that problem. I'm more than happy to help them out in any way. Yeah, I imagine what the digital mastermind could be a good place for them to get some support and perspective as well. For sure, yeah, yeah. It's like a victim's group. Yeah. <laughs> Growing a business is rough, man. Let me ask about your agency. Can you tell us a little bit about the agency you run and, and uh, the type of services you do and who you serve? Yeah. Uh, agency is Oyova, uh, Tiva of uh, uh, about 30. And we work with typically companies between 2 million and 50 million. We mm -hmm. offer uh, a lot of web development. That's about 60% 60, 60 of our revenue and the other is about 40%. And in that, we typically will uh, build or take over a website, we optimize it, and then we begin running uh, marketing campaigns for them. Besides the revenue, are there other characteristics that, that uh, make up a, an ideal client for you? Ideal clients are usually good people that like to pay on time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other than that, uh, from a vertical perspective, um, we, we do a fair amount in education, legal, membership companies. And, um, and then the other is, uh, it, it runs the gamut. So whether it's SaaS or e-commerce or, or a lot of mm -hmm. these others, I think one of our differentiators, uh, is we have a very deep tech bench. So in that we can do things at a rapid level, whether it's on the analytics side or, uh, on the paid, uh, ad side or web and app development that we see, um, some others get that they, that they'll stumble on. Yeah. That's all in-house too. When did you start the agency? 2009. So my business partner and I both started two agencies in 2009. The agency I had uh, was more on the uh, more marketing focused, all digital. And uh, he started a, a web development agency. And then we met through the digital mastermind. We just, you know, always talked about merging. And then the economy was roaring in 2018. And we just decided to go ahead and put these two things together. That's awesome. And how has the agency grown over the over the let's see, since 2009 to 2024? What are some of the major milestones, the major sort of 10x jumps in your in your agency business? I think uh, our inbound leads have just uh, completely skyrocketed. We, we won mm. some awards like Inc. 5000, a bunch of awards on Clutch. Um, nice. But we, we figured out our outbound strategy. We figured out uh, our inbound strategy. And we, we have a really good lead flow. And I'm knocking on wood, man. Any salesperson superstitious. I mean, sure. That's my primary yeah. role yeah. on, on yeah. revenue. Yeah. He's Keep it going. But I think that's what it is. And it's just really drilling down at the things you know uh, that the, the customers that would want to work with you have to see before they work with you. And mm. I believe we have that dialed in. And then also on that, a, a really solid sales process, something that is just trial and tribulation and error where we can rapidly quote and win business. So where, where do most of your inbounds come from? Uh, most of it's through uh, SEO. Mm. Um, so, so we get a lot of it through a SEO. And then um, the other is directories. So we get a lot through nice. uh, D Design Rush, Clutch, and I want to say there's two others that aren't mm -hmm. nearly as uh, driving, but still drive good leads. Nice. And what about outbound? You mentioned you've got some outbound going. Cold email, man. 
I do a it lot works. of cold email. It, it works. works. Yeah. yeah. I send anywhere from uh, 10 to 20,000 emails a month um, mm. out there. And uh, yeah, you get good leads. And that's the other thing too, dialing that in, right? Because when you first start that, I didn't really have it dialed in for like a year. It was just yeah. spending lots of time, lots of money, figuring out what's working, what's not, creating pattern interrupts and all mm -hmm. of these different little tactics. And it uh, it's now uh, one of our strongest lead channels. What's more important, uh, frequency or the content of the email? I think it's I think it's content mm. by far. Yeah, people are just bombarded with. I hope this email finds you well. Yeah, right. Or Good or day. now that AI, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Or now that AI is in there, I can just sniff an AI email out from like a mile away. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. We're, we're helping all these other businesses in St. Petersburg, Florida. I'm like, okay. Yeah. yeah all right. I, I think it's really just having something that fits your personality, right? That that's very important to your own personal brand as well as your company's brand. That's mm -hmm. going to get it into somebody's inbox is going to catch their attention, uh, potentially entertain them in some way and convince them to, uh, to have a call with you. And it, Interesting. it takes so you, a lot of work to get those right. Yeah. No, entertaining is also very hard, like to get the tone right. Yeah, it's, it's hard sure. to get that right. And then, so you said mentioned inbound, outbound. What was the third one? Sales process. Sorry, sales process. You've got it dialed yeah. in. So, what is what is the sales process? Is that productized sale? You know, it's all the prices on the website, or do you do fully bespoke or somewhere in between? How does that work? So, yeah, it's usually it's usually fully bespoke. So we have a team selling approach, right? So mm. qualification call, fan, budget, uh, authority, need, timing. That mm -hmm. all right? Then we get them on a call with the team. And then on that call, we're going to figure out everything within 30 minutes of what has to happen. And we're mm -hmm. really good at getting a budget. So I'm sure there's a lot of agencies on it on, uh, that are listening that probably struggle with that. But there, there, there's a lot of techniques on, on how to get that budget, mm -hmm. which I'm happy to go into. And I'm sure you yeah, have some good sure. ones. Yeah. And then um, from there, all we do is put together a quick spreadsheet. It's just, all right, we're going to do an outline. That, that outline is also a strategy in some sense, but we're just going to talk about all the things that need to be done. It's not going to be pretty. If you approve that, then we're going to go into whatever that work is next. And that, that's on the sales call. Like they're literally like building this sort of outline together. Is that yep, how it works? That, exactly. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And we're literally, we, we're time and materials. We've tried value-based pricing and some, mm -hmm. some aspects that really didn't fit um, yeah. our model. Yeah. Um, and then in there, they can uh, make a decision to, to move forward or not. And then in, we'll, we'll give them a proposal. Um, but we don't give a proposal until we get that verbal that they're ready to move forward because we're not in the business of creating proposals. That's super interesting. So it sounds like you're, uh, I imagine during that sales conversation, there's value being transferred, right? The fact that you're helping to outline this in real time, they're, they're, they're providing feedback and input. That's value. Totally. Yeah. It's all in the questions you're asking, right? So the, if you're asking very insightful questions, that's going to, to move them because you're continually challenging whether, whether it's what they know or what they don't know. And then also there's so many tools uh, that you can look at to really just dig into those right on the spot. And when they can see that transparency and the way that you do it at a very rapid rate, you earn a lot of trust. Tell us about the, the secrets behind getting the budget. There's a number of techniques, right? So in there, tell them the range of the, the prices that you work with. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, one of the things that I like to do is say, hey, do, do, do you have a budget? And then I can tell usually before they're going to what they're going to answer. Actually, actually, don't answer that yet. I want to let you know that, uh, you know, some of our clients are spending over uh, one hundred fifty thousand dollars a month and some are, are spending as little as two thousand dollars a month. Where do you think you fall within that range? Yeah. And then you're doing a pattern interrupt because they were ready to tell you no, or they may have been telling mm -hmm. you yes. And if they're going to tell you yes, I'm like, look, I got $23,000 to spend this month. That, right. that, that's okay, all I can go. do. So that's one technique. The other is um, where you just start calling out numbers. Uh, are we looking at like a $5,000 budget per month or 10,000? Well, people mm -hmm. are just instantly wanting to fill in the blank and answer that question. <laughs> um, so they're going to start there. And then yeah. when you actually get someone that is saying, hey, um, uh, no, I don't have a budget. The best thing to do there is um, to just start throwing out numbers again, saying, all right, like, what are we looking at here? Like, you don't have a budget, but if I, I want, I want you to be uncomfortable. Are we talking, and go high, go high. Are we talking about yeah. like something like a million dollars uh, this month? Is that what you're looking to spend? <laughs> and they're like, no. And they'll usually fill in the blank. If they don't right. start ticking the numbers back and somebody will always right. lock onto one. It's funny. I used to, when I was in sales, I worked at an agency selling enterprise level deals, PPC and SEO for big brands. 
and we used Bant. And I remember remember those type of conversations. It's been a while, but I I, I remember you know getting the budget was was a qualifier, so you had to get it. Yeah, you don't want to move forward without it because yeah. you're going to do yourself a disservice. So yeah. I, I highly recommend if somebody does not have that in their process to yeah. just make that because then you're going to get into the proposal business, and I heard that doesn't pay well, especially because it sounds like your approach is more on the bespoke side where you're uncovering their specific situation and you're mapping a solution to to help them based on that situation. So in 2009, was it when you were when you launched, I imagine it was just yourself or just a small team? Yeah, it was a small team. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, it was all uh, freelancers um, yeah. to start with. And then and then I got an office because I thought I really needed one. And I like I like an <laughs> office because I like a change of state. Sure. And then um, I, I remember we we had this attorney client. He said, "Hey, uh, he works in employment law." He's like, "Hey, are all these like uh, full time FTEs?" Uh, I was like, "No, actually, they're they're all contractors." He said, um, "Do you require them to like come in?" I was like, "Yeah, this is an office that, that I pay he's for." He's like, "No, they're employees." <laughs> yeah, he's like, "Dude, these are employees." He's like, "You're, he's like, you're gonna get in big trouble." Man. He's like, "This is what I do." He's like, "You're gonna learn my business, and you're gonna realize you can't do this." I was like, yeah. "Oh, all right." It was just, I didn't know, man. I right. was just one of those you know, things. Just an so, entrepreneur, right? Starting yeah, a business. Destroyed my profitability uh, within a week. It was, <laughs> you know, turning everybody that <laughs> wanted to be uh, a full-time employee. And uh, yeah, and then uh, just kept going from there. So you have this small team, contractors, then employees, subset of them. Um, I imagine you lead the team differently today than you did back in 2009. You've learned some things along the way. Yeah. What are some of the big milestones that you've, encountered as far as your ability to lead others? Autonomy is more important than tasking out every hour of the day for mm. one of your employees. If you hire smart people and you give them the, hey, this is what needs to happen, they typically will figure it out. Yeah, that's a big one. I, I tend to be the same way when I had a team. I had a team of 30 and I would give them a very clear expectation that was measurable it would, and they'd know when we would measure and we'd meet weekly. But beyond that, like they're professionals. They, they know that they were hired to do a job. They have a skill or an aptitude. Uh, I don't need to get in their business and figure out, figure out for them how they're going to get it done. They just need to get it done. Totally. And you don't want them to atrophy, right? If you bring in somebody yeah. that's exceptional and then you just start, hey, this is when you're going to eat lunch and this is the mm. things that you need to do today. You're weakening your team by doing that. That's awesome. What would be your parting advice for, particularly for agency owners who are struggling with scaling? Struggling with scaling? I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of things. Uh, yeah. one, one thing I recommend to, to people is getting comfortable being uncomfortable. It's some of the best advice I ever got from an agency owner that, that went out of business. And uh, when I asked him why, he said, we got complacent. We got, we got comfortable. He said, so get comfortable getting uncomfortable. So keep stretching. And then in that, there's a lot of talk about work-life balance and all those things. And um, it's not necessarily to, to interrupt that. Mm. It's to just really understand that you have to keep growing as, as a person. Your company will always be a reflection of that. And then uh, an, another thing in, that, that I recommend in scaling is choose a niche. I think that's that's a big mistake that we made early on is we were trying to be all things to, to everyone. Yeah. And you have to understand what you're really good at. And if you can understand what you're really good at and who you work really well with in, in yeah. doing that thing, you can be wildly successful. You'll win more business. You'll have a higher profit margin. It, it, it can be fantastic. Granted, there's, there's always downsides. There's always, there's always downsides. It's always, the grass is always greener and, and there's no perfect uh, business model for sure. Got it. So don't be complacent. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable and choose a niche to lean into to help you to scale and improve improve profitability and in valuation. I've seen agencies that are focused on a vertical get better valuations as well. So great point. What's your motivation, John? Man, I love people. And mm. so I can tell you like why I really got into this. I remember I was working for this other agency. And then if you remember in like 2008, like 2009, that's when the, the downturn happened yeah. right in the market. My family uh, had a construction company and one of the, their, their biggest issues is they didn't have good marketing and they didn't have a brand. They essentially lost everything for the most part and uh, they're, they're doing okay now. But what I realized there is I wanted to help small companies in, the, in small companies like my, like my parents' company. And I wanted to create jobs because literally my parents were looking for jobs at that time. That's what I did when I first started. We helped a lot of like little mom and pops. We don't work with too many anymore. But one of the cool things, um, and it's a question we still ask our clients is, um, if we do this initiative and it reaches that goal, let's say that you wanted to put, you know, three, four million on top line revenue, how many jobs will that create? 
And that's one of the things I love to do most. I don't want to just save somebody a bunch of money, right? I'm, I'm not a finance guy and you know, uh, that, that's not my role. I love to create jobs because mm -hmm. work gives purpose. And when you can do that, because there's nothing sadder than when somebody doesn't. So my love for people and the ability to create jobs and what I do by, you know, uh, essentially driving revenue numbers and a lot of our marketing initiatives is something that, you know, continues to motivate me. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's awesome. Where could people reach out to you and to maybe learn more about the digital mastermind? And you have a summit coming up in September. Wait, how could they um, find you? They can uh, find me on LinkedIn. So if, uh, I have a very uncommon last name. That, that's one way to do it. That Corey loves to pronounce. And uh, the other, you could just shoot me an email, john, J-O-N, at digitalmastermind.com. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Like I said, I love people. I love helping people. And uh, check out digitalmastermind.com. Fill out an application if you want to join. You can also check out some, some stuff there about the event. And yeah, oh man, appreciate your time today. And uh, yeah, love to talk with anybody that uh, wants to have a conversation. Beautiful. Well, your, your love for helping others was definitely evident today. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom and your experience with us. Oh, man. Thanks for having me. This was a, this awesome. was a blast. Really appreciate it, Corey. That's it for today. I'm Corey Quinn, and I hope you join me again next time on the Deep Specialization Podcast. If you received value from this show, please go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.